So ladies and gentlemen, a good morning and a welcome. Uh, this is Bhavna Bhatia, your host, uh, welcoming you all to the eighth edition of the Payments and Card Summit and Awards 2020 on behalf of Kamikaze B2B Media. Well, this summit is uh, built exclusively for cards and payments executives. The program includes cutting edge insights from industry leaders and features in-depth panel discussions and networking to ensure that you're making the most of your time. Well, you'll be intellectually stimulated by innovators and business leaders as they discuss the current situation, future trends, and innovations in payments and cards market. Well, the theme of uh, this year's conference is Payments 4.0, unraveling the digital opportunity. And our conference will be followed by the Payments and Cards Awards this evening between 5.45 to 6.45 p.m. Indian Standard Time. So ladies and gentlemen, once again, a huge, huge welcome to the eighth edition of the Payments and Cards Summit and Awards 2020. Well, with this, uh, we're going to be just taking a minute uh, to get ready for our first uh, panel discussion. We'll see you on the other side. Why don't you meanwhile check my chats and explore the other uh, opportunities in the software and we'll see you in the next one minute. Thank you all for joining us. So ladies and gentlemen, now for our first panel discussion, uh, let's begin the summit with the panel discussion and the theme of this session, Leadership 4.0, Leadership in Payments 4.0, Promise and Challenges in the New Ecosystem. But I'd like to introduce to you the moderator of this session, Mr. Mihir Gandhi. Well, Mihir is a partner leader payments transformation PWC India. Mihir has more than 16 years of consulting experience in the areas of strategy, market assessment, studies, business plan, operational process improvement, due diligence, uh, technology consulting, and implementation support for clients primarily in the banking and financial services industries across India, Middle East, and Africa. Well, ladies and gentlemen, let's also welcome all our esteemed panelists. First up, Ms. Jaya Janardana, the Chief Operating Officer, Indostar Capital Finance Limited. Jaya has over 25 years of banking experience and has worked across multiple banks. Her expertise has been in operations, technology, and digital banking. We're also joined by Mr. Jagdish Narayanan, the Chief Information Officer, Reliance Geo Payments Bank. Well, Jagdish is a techno uh, professional with extensive experience of more than two decades in the banking industry. Ladies and gentlemen, we're also joined by Mr. Neeraj uh, Thrashawala, uh, the business head payment solutions and consumer finance ICICI Bank Limited. Well, Neeraj has had an illustrious career at ICICI. He has strong relationships with the network partners over his 15 years of long career with the bank and worked closely with Visa, MasterCard, NPCI, and NHAI. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're also joined by Mr. Bikram Yadav, the business head credit cards, RBL Limited, uh, Bank Limited. Bikram has 18 plus years of experience in uh, product management, distribution management, new product launch, team management, portfolio management. And also we're gonna be joined by our panelists, Mr. Satish N. Mohan, the deputy chief product officer, FSS, which is the financial software and systems. Well, Satish is an agile, a techno-functional product expert with over 20 years of experience in the FinTech space and has successfully launched globally recognized products. Ladies and gentlemen, also joining us is Ms. Deeksha Kaushal, Managing Director, Head of Cash Product and Innovation Treasury and Trade Solutions, Citibank India. Well, Deeksha is a banker with the expertise in payments and cash management across retail and corporate client segments. Well, ladies and gentlemen, with this, I present to you our entire esteemed panel on your stage and screen. And with this, I'd like to leave it in the able hands of Mr. Gandhi to take it forward, who's the session chair and who will be moderating it further. Also, I'd request uh, everyone, if you do have any questions for our eminent panelists, to please type it in the Q&A tab while viewing and watching this panel discussion. We'll uh, pass it on to the moderator at the end of the session, if time allows. With this, I'd like to pass it in the able hands of Mihir to take it forward with this panel. Thank you so much for joining us. Over to you, Mihir. Thanks, thanks, Bhavna. Good morning, everyone. And uh, very happy to be here as part of this esteemed panel to discuss on uh, 
the leadership and the next uh, set of requirements from a leadership perspective for digital payments. <clears throat> this panel is in itself a unique one for me. Uh, I have been part of many events and different discussions, uh, but we always discuss on the business side, operation side, the technology side, uh, risk regulatory side, or even the fraud side. But we haven't much dwelled into the leadership aspects and what it takes to become a really good leader for a digital payments industry. Uh, with the way the industry is evolving and growing and with the new demands that it is actually throwing up, uh, the, the requirements of a person leading the entire business is changing. And uh, with that, we thought that we should have uh, you know, this topic in mind and invite some of our esteemed members to speak on what they believe is going to happen going forward and what are the qualities that is required from a leadership uh, for digital payments. With that in context, I would like to uh, start uh, the panel and you know, have the first area of discussion where we talk about you know, what is the actual role of a chief of digital payments of, or chief digital officer. Uh, is it the prerogative, is, is, digi is digital going, is going digital the prerogative of uh, only one person or is it the prerogative of the entire organization? So uh, I would like to ask this question to Jaya to start the panel and uh, just get her views. Jaya, if you can throw some light on what do you see the role of the chief digital officer of the head of digital payments in a bank or in any payments company? How has it evolved? How is it going to evolve and what's going to be the next, you know, from a futuristic perspective? Uh, thank you, Mihir. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Yeah, you are. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, this is the new uh, C uh, word that is there in, the, uh, in all organizations which has come in, uh, among the other Cs which are uh, on the top level uh, uh, that the organization has. And I think suddenly this uh, chief digital officer is now has two versions of it. One, he's also looked upon as a god who will make all the changes. And second is he's also looked upon as a devil, which means he's, he's bringing in huge cost. But if you really uh, look at your chief digital officer uh, role, uh, I think uh, it's, it, it has now uh, stemmed that everybody is getting digital, so we need to get digital. So we need to have a CDO. But what? how do you equip a CDO to actually become successful? I don't think much thought has gone about with it. So, uh, you know, my own experience, not being, a, not as a chief digital officer, but being heading the digital, uh, you know, portfolio for some time in uh, all the organizations that I've worked the last uh, 10 years. Uh, the, uh, you know, everybody, uh, there is, uh, people don't really understand what it is to go digital. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, and therefore, without really understanding what it is to go digital, everybody has deployed a CDO. Now, this CDO is actually a renaissance office. You know, he's, a, he's going to bring up what the whole change which will take the organization to the next level is what uh, the organization thinks. So I actually have, uh, you know, I have, I have actually put up a few points which I think I wanted to share in terms of what we want a digital officer to be. So I think a digital officer actually needs to be somebody who has a vision and a purpose. A, a, you know, he needs to actually uh, understand where the organization is going and how is it going to be different going forward, number one. Uh, bring in some bit of governance, some bit of literacy in terms of digital and also develop an environment. Everybody should not look at it as, as something which is forced upon them, but to be part and parcel of the growing up of the organization. That is very critical. Second is, uh, we, he needs to create conditions for people to experiment, okay? Because uh, every time it is uh, critical, people don't know what they're getting into. So they need to know that there is need to be a reward and experiment because unless you experiment, it will not, you, know, you won't be successful because unless you experiment only, you will go to know. So this particular person should actually be able to, you know, enable people to experiment. Third is he also has to empower to, you know, for people to think very differently. You cannot, you cannot drive digital. You have to build that digital, you know, drive the change in the organization. Uh, 
and many a times what we do is we sit in the you know the four walls of the ac rooms and try and build a digital strategy strategy for a digital is at the ground level it is customer who drives you today it is not you who drive the customer so it is the customer's expectation that you need to build you need to think before the customer and then de develop your uh, strategy so therefore you need to actually not just uh, you know uh, think differently but also you have to behave and act differently and foster a inclusive leadership you can't say this is what it is and you have to do it unless you actually get people along with you you will never be able to drive digital and i'm telling you all this with my own experience when i was told to drive digital in the organization and i started doing work i realized nobody aligned with you no one until later when the kris of the team was built saying that this piece you have to do bring it to digital business this is the expect this is what your customer experience will be into this is your metric to drive your cost and then suddenly came a turn around people came and asked oh how do we do it differently how do we do this digital how can we do a bot how can we do an rpa how can we do uh, you know uh, drive things so these are i think these four uh, uh, elements of uh, quality is something that we would look in a uh, in a, a digital leader and uh, one thing we should also understand is uh, a digital officer why we call him as a god and we want him to do things differently and bring about a huge uh, change in the system uh, you know he he battles through a lot of uh, mindsets in the organization okay he has to align the stakeholders he has to actually uh, bring in partnerships he has to develop skills he has to get people along so i think it is a collaborative effort that needs to be in the organization and not let him do things alone it can never succeed so me from my perspective it's a it's a inclusive uh, you know building up of a of a particular role rather than you know get someone as a seed you and say okay you drive digital in the organization so that's thanks thanks point. thanks a lot jay i think very insightful uh, comments that you have made in terms of you know what's the expected role and you know given your personal experience i think it adds a lot more weightage and credibility saying that things should happen on the ground and not sitting in the walls of the office uh, thank you so much for your views uh, uh, thank you uh, moving to the next person that i wanted to ask this question bikram uh, you are from the bank and you know you've got good experience on the payment side and the card side uh, just wanted your thoughts on a similar question and you know uh what do you think has changed uh in the last few years and what is going to change going forward given that payments and digital is now a big theme uh in most banks and most organizations just wanted to hear from you so a uh, couple of things which which i would say that has changed in the macro environment is that dig digital consumption has been democratized so sorry bikram uh, you're uh, breaking up if you can just come slightly i Okay. So what I'm saying uh, is it better now? Yeah, it's it's slightly better. Yes. Okay. So what I'm saying is that in in last five years, at least what we have seen in in uh, credit cards or in the payment world is that uh, digital has been not very right. audible. Vikram, sorry, Nira, yes, not very audible. Yeah, it's not very audible. Ah, yeah. uh, is this audible now? Yeah, it's better. Ah, uh, is it okay if I stop the video and then try? sure okay so my, my point is that in card credit card world we have seen that uh, digital behavior has been democratized earlier we used to see that uh, you know there were certain categories of consumptions which were happening digitally on certain profile of customers were more digitally savvy but today as we see uh, i mean right from mass to affordable to uh, mass affluent to affluent the digital penetration has gone high up in behavior as well as uh, you know infrastructure availability so that has you know driven the consumer behavior to do things with lot more convenience than the reg the regular friction of a physical world now i i just going back to that same question which gaya was saying that this digital officer turning around the way of doing business in an entire organization is is a tough ask from a single vertical or a single role uh, one has to see from a customer standpoint that where that behavior is is going uh, to give you an example uh, i i don't think so that you know physical uh, airline booking is there anymore 
because of the choice, the convenience, everything on the fingertip. So it was not driven by people trying to digitize it. It is just that consumer decided that you know this is the easier way. Similarly, hotel booking and and so on and so forth. So my sense is that uh, this democratize democratization will continue to happen. And if organizations were to not and and you know typically a regulated entity, banks and all. Uh, are little more rigid in in regulating themselves around papers and all, but I think consumers and and the the gap would be fulfilled by new age players who would come up and introduce technology which is uh, amenable to consumers, and and then therefore the edge of of being in that uh, game would would reduce for people who are not. Thinking uh, digital as a full organization and not just appointing one person to turn that up. Sure, sure. Great. Thanks. Thanks uh, a lot, Bikram. Nihir. Uh, just a moment. Just wanted to ask, uh, Bikram, would you like to put your video on? Just in case, I'm just informing you. Yeah, perfect. Because your video was not on while you were talking. Thank you. Over to you, Mr. Gandhi. Thanks, Ta. Uh, thanks, Bikram, for your uh, inputs. Uh, I think you are very right in the sense that. because the customer behavior is changing and uh, digital is being democratized at the product and the business uh, use case level i think the role also needs to change accordingly uh, thanks for that uh, moving on to satish uh, satish i wanted to ask you a separate related question which is from your perspective what do you think are the qualities required for a person who wants to you know focus uh, you know being a leader in the digital payment space uh should that person uh you know be more uh, understanding of the business environment and the pnl or should the person be more savvy from a regulatory and a risk perspective uh should the person know more on the technology so if we say one role in the bank or any organization which is you know head of digital payments then what are the kind of qualities uh, satish from your perspective you feel that that person should have um so he, i think uh, one of the uh, there are multiple aspects that a leader should look at i think uh, fundamentally business are there to uh, service customer and going by the topic of the discussion that you have picked up today which is uh, 4.0 payment 4.0 which fundamentally talks about faster more efficient and customer centric which has been the driver and thanks to the pandemic situation in a way you know our uh, speed at which our digital adoption has grown up so as a leader i think uh, what's happened is that uh, uh, their ability to keep the focus on in terms of what the business outcomes are so uh, uh, important aspect for a leader is to set the north star get the vision clearly communicated or defined for what it is for the next 1 to 3 years and then be able to convince and communicate so that the team uh, around him and uh, the peers and the team completely understand what this vision and what's the purpose behind the vision and why it's important for us to work towards it the moment you get that level of alignment from the rest of the organization in terms of what the vision where the organization is heading your ability to bring a complete uh, alignment of the workforce to this initiative becomes a lot, lot more better the second one is uh, communicate or over communicate in certain scenarios in in this current context i think uh, uh, while we are socially distant it is very important that you are emotionally closer closer to your team and which means you you are as a leader uh, one of the important aspect is to be able to communicate more often on why we are doing what you are doing and how it's important from the organization perspective and uh, I, I, and i think in the last 8 9 months since the lockdown i think there has been various pivoting that has happened in different business forum right we have seen lot of objective lot of opportunities that have evolved and the speed at which you are able to respond and adopt to those changes and get the teams to work on it is very important and that's where the over communication comes into play making teams and people understand why those things have to be done uh, i think both i heard both jaya and uh, um, uh, you know vikram uh, uh, talking about uh, the cdo and uh, how they've been involved in it in my in my perspective it should it should be more of a board initiative and uh, as long as there is a, a, a directive coming from the board and the board understands the need for uh, digital adoption or digital transformation uh, understanding the relevance of data uh, and being able to build a data driven organization thereby your ability to take decisioning more based on data becomes a, a prevalent element as part of your organization and keeping your organization more open given that open banking and psd2 is evolved uh, you know how much of uh, api enablement can you do and for all of this to happen simultaneously when your teams are kind of 
you know distributed uh, uh, and new people are being onboarded uh, on a digital mode it's it's about the leadership's key qualities are getting the vision uh, very uh, very clearly articulated and well defined making sure the purpose is understood by the team getting a complete an alignment of the team to work towards the larger purpose of what this organization is working towards and bringing all kinds of technology enablement and tools that will help them you know be able to be extremely productive and still find their space as they work on this so in, in a concise manner um, here these are my uh, initial thoughts on this point thanks thanks sapish so uh, ess- essentially what you're saying is that the person should be able to influence his teams create a clear vision or plan of where the organization and how the strategy needs to go and also communicate well and you know kind of uh, define and course correct whenever there is a requirement to do that so great great thanks thanks so much i think that's a, a, a very uh, you know good point on the softer and the people aspects uh, but i also wanted to uh, check and maybe i'll move on to the next question is uh, what are the hard metrics or you know the kras that we believe uh, would a leader need to uh, you know kind of look at if he wants to focus on digital payments and maybe i'll probably start with diksha uh, diksha if you can throw some light on that given your experience and organization uh, what are the key metrics and the you know kras that you feel a leader who leads the digital payment space should have uh thanks meer and uh, you know i want to start off by sharing uh, a couple of uh, anecdotes um i had the opportunity you know since all of us are so fed up of sitting at home uh for the past many months to go out for a very short break and as i was sitting in the open air reception of a you know fairly well known uh, hotel brand uh what i saw was that while they've taken care of social distancing everywhere and customer experience is one of the biggest credos of the organization uh when it came to the payment channel uh, they had only you know couple of edcs Uh, and when uh, individuals started to take out their credit cards quite a few of them had forgotten their pins uh, because over the past few months they were pretty much doing online transactions and uh, they were not you know going and typing pins on edcs uh, they did have a qr code but that was at the reception it was static and it was you know pasted there so uh, since they didn't want people to queue up at the reception the qr code never really got used uh the other um, anecdote that you know comes to my mind is when uh, we uh, were trying to do a cross border transaction and uh, you know a couple of our friends saw that the transaction failed uh the reason being that uh, uh, you know they didn't know that at the back end the card was not uh, enabled for international transactions so uh, where i'm going with this is that you know while we think that payments uh, is something which is a separate department could be a digital office etc but like jaya mentioned at the beginning it finally boils down to a very essential part of the customer experience not only in terms of satisfaction but in terms of getting that commerce done and the transaction done and studies say that almost up to 40% of uh, e-commerce transactions sometimes get impacted because of friction in the payments experience uh so metrics around this therefore are very important for the commercial the business the product and the sales teams and not just you know one individual digital unit so to speak uh and in that light uh, i would say that you know it's a bit of a yin and a yang uh, we should have a combination of external metrics and internal uh, the external should try and bring the outside in uh, so really focused on the customer experience in terms of uh, to start with if you know your client base is likely to be like in the first example i gave everyone carrying you know a high end smartphone uh, do you have a mobile payment method where they don't have to you know try and remember their pins or if you know you have a client base which is more digital uh, then do you have a payment method which talks to that and to remember the penetration of payment methods in the country for example in india um, digital payments are now becoming more and more upi or qr codes led uh, cards is there but it is you know smaller percentage of what we have uh the second on the external side would be in terms of continually looking at what are success rates and what are the root causes for you know payment success rates to be where they are are there other alternate payment methods that can allow you to have better success rates and then of course i think uh, on the internal side which is equally important and you know you've talked about it uh, there are a lot of regulations that keep changes in changing in this space and you know we are uh, fortunate to be in such a progressive regulatory environment on the payment side so keeping abreast of those uh, trends uh, making ourselves future ready 
Uh, looking at continuity of business, I think COVID has taught us all, you know, how important resilience is. Uh, testing out, therefore, you know, uh, what can we do if one payment method were to fail and instead of credible backup so that customer experience doesn't get impacted. And then last, I would say, is having metrics on volumes, on capacity, uh, on cybersecurity, given how important data has become. Um, and if you have a measured, uh, you know, approach to it with, let's say, you know, a cadence on a regular uh, uh, review, I would say at a board level, uh, that's when, you know, you have the right attention, both from the commerce and business side, as well as the payment side. Uh, understood. Thanks, uh, Diksha, for sharing that. So what you're saying is it has to be a mix of external and internal metrics. And uh, a focus should be on, you know, customer Focus should be on uh, uptime. Focus should be on uh, the internal part, on the risk and regulatory, on the fraud, on the cybersecurity volumes, etc. This is, oh, assume, I'm assuming, over and about the usual business targets and the sales numbers that you know the person is expected to drive as part of the through the digital payments methods. So great, thank you so much, Diksha, for your uh, inputs. Uh, uh, Neeraj, I also wanted to ask you a similar question uh, on what's been your experience at the bank and you know what you feel should be the key metrics or KPIs. Uh, Diksha did talk about some interesting ones, but also I thought I'll get your views on this. No, so I think metrics uh, and uh, let me just start by saying uh, that we, there should be some hard metrics that one needs to look at and it could be customer adoption, merchant adoption, uh, network adoption. Some of those metrics are something that uh, we should, as an as an organization, look at, because you know customer adoption is what will drive the transaction going forward, and that is one metric that uh, that has good uh, stood us in good stead on any new innovation, product innovation that we do, and uh, that's something that we try to do either uh, meeting the customer physically and checking what the experience was all about. Because any new payment mode that you launch or any new payment method that goes out in the market, we need to understand whether it has actually met because we might think that, you know, it is solving a problem. But does it, does it actually solve a problem is something that one needs to look at. Apart from these two or three metrics that I talked about, obviously, uh, digital is business, right? So uh, if it's business, then does it make commercial sense for all the stakeholders in the ecosystem? because it has to be sustainable in the long term. So these are a couple of things that I, I would like to mention from my side. Okay, great. Great, thanks. Thanks a lot, Neeraj. Thanks for your view. So uh, understood, it has to be linked to your metrics, uh, business uh, related KPIs, your numbers and volumes, and also you know what you mentioned earlier on the customer side and whether adoption will pick up. So I think that's mainly from an experience perspective, how do you you know, push the customer to adopt and, you know, as Jaya also men mentioned at the start, how do you make it seamless for the customer to use it uh, and, you know, adopt it very quickly. But thanks, thanks Neeraj for that. Uh, I uh, wanted to <clears throat> all, then move on to the, lead, uh, to, you know, when we speak about leadership in payments and when we speak about talent, uh, how are we seeing talent uh, nowadays, right? Because uh, payments in itself has grown in the last 10 years and most of us have been fortunate to be part of that journey. Uh, we know it's a relatively close-knit kind of uh, industry and most of us know each other and you know, know who is working where and stuff like that. So if we have to expand exponentially, say the way China did or the way you know, other countries are in the pro process of doing, and India is also expected to see that growth very, very quickly, what is the kind of leadership patterns that we need? And maybe Jagdish, uh, I'll invite you to speak at this point of time in terms of, you know, should the emphasis be on building talent internally or should we be getting, you know, happy talent from outside from say other unrelated industries, say from a retail or from, a, you know, a technology business and then try and, you know, have those people adapt to the payments world. So just wanted your views on that Jagdish, if you can, you're a new Jagdish. Yeah. Uh, hey, uh, so here's the, here's the deal. Uh, now, the first thing to look for is what is the skill, what is the talent that we are looking forward to here? Now, let us just, just flip back a little bit, uh, you know, maybe about 15, 20 years back, we can, the digital wasn't as prevalent as it is right now. 
uh, there was still a, a paradigm shift going on at that time of saying, okay, rather than people walking to banks, can banks go to customers? Okay. Now that itself immediately brought about a sea change uh, in the kind of uh, services that the, that, that uh, you know financial services the way it had to be delivered to the customer, and hence the kind of talent that was required. Now, if I just flip back to now, the same uh, thought process can be applied even to a pure digital thing. Now, here's the deal: in a day, how often would I use my banking app or my payments app for how many minutes or hours versus how often would I use WhatsApp or some other app? app it's a no brainer okay now digitally can we do the same thing as we did physically 15 years ago as in rather than the customer going to the banking app can the bank app go to the customer through whatsapp or through some other means right so uh, it's everything going undergoing this paradigm shift and hence the skill sets required are people that can think about it in this manner and say how can i do it now it might Technically translate to SDKs or you know React app, apps and etc. That is pure technology aspect of it. The key thing is to see how can I deliver these new paradigms, okay, to the customer in in the modern changing world. How how can I bring uh, my financial services into the everyday space and not inside one specific app on the fourth tab of the of the smartphone when you flip through the first three pages. Okay, can it be there everywhere? You know, in all kinds of devices, can customer service be there in every mechanism? Do I need to again go to a specific part of the app or you know give a phone or customer care number? That's all past. I mean, nobody uses those kinds of techniques anymore. So whenever we hire talent. Uh, it would definitely have to be a combination of hiring talent from the market for maybe pure play tech skills or whatever, but also grow internally these thought processes and these mechanisms. Now, it's like this. It's digital pervades through everything. It is not just the customer payments part of it. It's everything from hiring employees. Can we do, I mean, we do interviews digitally. We hire onboard employees digitally. Regulators are, uh, are completely digital right now. We submit everything digitally. Every aspect of it is there. So whatever we hire is a person or a team that is enabled and empowered and skilled to deliver all of these pieces. And I don't think you can just get somebody with this kind of a JD right off the show, out of the market. And that I'll be, I can, I'll, I'll literally pay anything to get that kind of a person. But it's definitely a combination of hiring and continuous upskilling and coming up the curve. That's really my thought on this one. Thanks, thanks, Agdish. Uh, interesting, interesting point of view. Uh, uh, Diksha, I wanted to ask you the same question in terms of what do you think is your viewpoint of you know having leaders uh, and how do you you know build leaders? So do do we group them internally or do you get them from adjacent industries and try and see how their you know experiences can benefit the payments world? So uh, you know my uh, take on this would be that uh, it would take a mix. Uh, you need to have some, uh, you know, leaders in your team who are uh, experts on what the technology is, uh, so that they can um, bring to, uh, you know, like uh, some of my co-panelists mentioned that if you're thinking of a custom experience or we're thinking of a common vision, uh, they are the experts to see how can uh, we have a path to execute on that. But at the same time, uh, a lot about payments is uh, uncharted. Uh, the technology is changing every day. And uh, given the fact that innovation is genuinely a way of life in this space, and especially in a country like India, which is seeing an inflection point and exponential growth, uh, having uh, you know, leaders or team members who are from other industries is equally important because uh, they can uh, bring in a fresh perspective. Uh, they can also bring in that custom experience and the important linkage on how you know, payments needs to be embedded everywhere at every point of commerce. Uh, and therefore it needs to be a mix because uh, often people with a lot of experience in the same area might not be able to read the trend before it happens, but someone who's coming from an adjacent area might. Um, and we've also seen in terms of a lot of startups that people who went on to launch big payment companies were not really payment professionals to start with, but uh, they got those people on their board as you know they went about um, on their execution path. So in my mind, it should be a mix. 
Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Diksha, for your views. Uh, I, yeah, I, I mean, even I would tend to agree. It has to be a mix of people. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is what we are also seeing in different parts of the world that, you know, we need a mix of people who understand payments and who ha have different skill sets to run businesses, have strong execution capabilities that can actually benefit the overall ecosystem. So thank you for your views. Uh, moving on. Uh, we wanted to, uh, I wanted to understand uh, what are the challenges that all of us are facing from a talent perspective. Uh, are we getting the right talent? Are we having the right people coming on board, helping us personally? Uh, while, you know, I have also seen the space, I even mean, I have faced certain challenges in getting the right talent who understand the business, who can grow the business very, very uh, you know, uh, uh, quickly and adapt to the fast changing complex environment that we are seeing in the uh, payments and the digital space. Uh, Jaya, I would like to invite you and, uh, you know, just give your viewpoints of what are the challenges, if any, you have been seeing to get the right talent, right leadership in this uh, space. So many, uh, I'll break this up into two parts. <clears throat> One is with respect to talent and second is with respect to leadership. Uh, you see, uh, like Jatish mentioned and Diksha was mentioning, see, these are not talent which is available off the shelf. Okay, So digital per se has two parts to it. One is the technology part to it and one is, uh, you know, doing things differently, especially in the financial services. Okay. Uh, we have been doing a particular process in a particular way. Okay, how do you define it differently in a digital mode? Okay, so you can have a technology team who can help you deliver, but the person who is doing this has to have a very very innovative mind. Okay, the you know every day I do I put a stamp on this into another challenge. If I had to do it digitally, how do I do it digitally? Okay. The question is whether people on the job can think differently or whether you need people coming from outside to look at it differently. Both helps. It is not that both doesn't help. But there is a, a very uh, inner, uh, and I am and telling it of my own personal experience, and this has happened with a lot of people. The more and more you think innovative, the more and more you want to think differently, you automatically will find this coming out from those people who will actually make digital successful. But uh, when it comes to leadership, now coming back to the leadership, so if you go out and search for people of talent and say, okay, I want someone who's digitally inclined, you may get people who come for the interviews, but when you come onto the table, you'll say, oh, I did this in ABC company, so let's do it over here. It's not looking at here and then making a difference. That's where you require the talent. Someone who will actually look at your space and look at it differently. So that's where we still have a gap and we've still not been able to uh, probably, uh, you know, uh, you have not reached that level, I think, according because I've been meeting up with candidates, I've been meeting up with people, and I feel they find it very strongly about. Now, when it comes to leadership, see, uh, there are two sides of pressures that the leadership undergoes. One is because the organization thinks that you have to move digitally, there's a pressure from the board, there's a pressure from the CEO, and obviously he has to deliver. But at the same time, his peers and his colleagues and his subordinates are not aligned to him. Because everybody has their own agenda to run with. So first and foremost, for him to create that environment and then start working on it is a huge, huge uh, task for him. And I, I can bet you, bet you, bet all my money on the table for this. All the CEOs can tell you that they actually reach a state of frustration because uh, while peers, while subordinates, to some extent, will walk forward and support them. There is one animal called the risk piece, the CISO piece, the CRO piece, which refuses to budge from what they are drawn up. So his challenge to make that, break the wall through that piece is a huge thing. So actually for me, the way I look at it is all elements has to come together to make that, that you know, that woman or that man succeed in that role of, a, you know, in that leadership role. Uh, but uh, yes, I think uh, we have moved quite a bit. I mean, I think from where we were to now we are, most organizations are seeing that paradigm shift happening. Most organizations are allowing the, see, the, the, the digital officer to come in place and start and, you know, start giving him that space to build.
but uh, Mihir, according to me, it's still a long way off. Thanks, thanks, Jaya. Uh, I agree with you. I mean, there's lots to be done and a lot of things uh, that can be done. Uh, in fact, in an ideal world, what they say is that once the organization has evolved and matured on a digital quotient perspective, you actually don't need a CDO. And the CDO actually metamor metamorphizes to the role of a CEO or a chief business officer. And that's what would be the ideal state, you know, so as to speak. So you're absolutely right. I mean, yeah, that, that's, what, that's what we want. All of us would aspire to go there. Uh, Neeraj, I would also want to ask you the similar question. What are the challenges that you have been facing on the talent perspective? And, you know, what are the issues that you have been seeing, not only at the junior level, but also at the leadership level? I mean, how do you see that changing? So I have a very counter opinion. Yeah. So um, I feel that there is no challenge in uh, recruiting or hiring people only because uh, digital is such a new thing that, you know, even uh, people within the organization are learning. So it's better to have somebody without any baggage come in and help us develop or build a process. And I think that has worked very well for us. And uh, I've seen that work beautifully. So I, I, in my personal opinion, I'd rather have somebody without any digital experience come and join because the person comes with without any baggage and helps in creating something very intuitively. So per se, if you ask me, there is no challenge in, in uh, recruiting. The only uh, area that one has to be focused on is to have very, very strong uh, focus on execution and metrics that you need, you want to track. Uh, what gets tracked gets done is how uh, I operate. And I think uh, simply put, if you are, if you have, uh, are able to recruit people who, who have the hunger and the, and the drive, I think uh, there is no dearth of, uh, of people who can work with you to create a process or build a product. Understood. That's an interesting view also. And that's why I asked you, I asked the question to some of the other panelists, whether we should have people from the industry or from adjacent or new industries like technology or retail or, you know, some other companies. So yeah, maybe that's worked for you. And maybe that could be a cue for some of our other industry members of, you know, how they can look at talent and get people who are hungry to execute new projects. So thanks. Thanks a lot. Nilaj. Thank you for your views. Uh, moving on to the next area that we wanted to cover uh, on a training perspective, right? So we've seen so many new technologies coming in, so so many new, you know, uh, trends that we are seeing. How does one keep abreast of you know uh, new things happening? And the Indian payment space is evolving so fast. So how does one upskill? How does one you know keep track of that? Uh, maybe Bikram, if you can share your views of what you have been seeing in the bank and, you know, what you see outside as a success mantra, I think that would be helpful to, for us to understand. Uh, Meet uh, this question is fusion of your last question and, and this and I would want that algorithm to answer on both. My sense is that uh, I, I think both talent and training wise, uh, there has to be a few steps taken on both sides. Because conventionally how uh, banking was that there were bankers and then there were technology service providers. The bankers didn't understand technology, technology service providers didn't understand uh, banking. So uh, I think there is now a need to learn on both the sides. Because there is a set pattern on which technology service provider works. They'll ask you that what do you need? And then they'll ask you to write what do you need and then they'll deliver what has been written. Whereas then uh, I think the new age requirement is that you need to know the fundamentals of consumer behavior, fundamentals of banking, fundamentals of regulation and what are the, the uh, what do you say, limitations of technology and abilities of technology to arrive at a solution wearing all four hats. Now, one of the guys might be wearing a stronger hat, another guy might be wearing a little weaker hat, but a, a, a fair bit of orientation has to be there uh, in, in your team uh, around the overall objective. Overall objective is to deliver a particular service or product to the customer, uh, you know, keeping the balance sheet in mind, keeping uh, business rules in mind, and technology limitation also in mind. 
So I, I think some bit of uh, business people have to have a technology background and some bit of technology people should uh, brush up around around the consumer behavior and business. Uh, and from top management standpoint, and I think it's time for reskilling of the top management also. Uh, top management has to be uh, open to environment and an observant to the environment rather than, I mean, a lot of things I have, I have at least seen that uh, the personal bias of a top management uh, restricts the organization to break the, you know, traditional way of doing things and move towards the, uh, you know, so, so important is that top management knows that what is the spirit of doing things in traditional manner and how that can, that spirit can be lived with a digital method. So, I mean, it's a cross-functional, I mean, you need to create at least leadership level, you need to have a little well-rounded general managers rather than, you know, uh, specialists. And then you can always hire specialists within the teams to, to take on the focus. Sure, thanks. Hi, good thanks, morning. Ma Anjit. Thanks, uh, Bikram. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, just wanted to continue on that trail of thought that Bikram you just said, and maybe I'll ask uh, the question to Jagdish. Uh, Jagdish, uh, uh, how important? Uh, you know, Bikram spoke about you know uh, you know uh, upskilling the top management and also ensuring that they understand what are the new things, and then you can get the technical people down the line. How important is diversity in that context? And you know. When I say diversity, it's not only, you know, uh, gender diversity, it could be other forms of diversity. So how do you, how important do you see diversity as a key factor? So uh, the most important thing here is one, uh, that in this entire complete digital sort of uh, drive or revolution or whatever we call it, one of the important things that we might or we can very easily overlook is the personal aspect of it. Yes, gone are the days when people walk up to branches. Agreed. But there is also a good, nice side to it. I go meet a guy, the guy, we have a nice chat and they, you know, there's, there's a personal touch to the whole thing and then he solves my problem and then, we, and then in, the, in the course of the conversation, something else comes up and, and the whole bunch of things get done, right? Now, the uh, flip to digital. Uh, you do the whole thing, you know, you just want one transaction, you go to one menu option, you click on a button, you do a bunch of things and that transaction is done, over, go, get out, finished. Okay, so it is it is so transactional, so impersonal and so, you know, that, that, that person touch is completely lost. And that is where we need diversity of all sorts of people with all, coming from all kinds of you know, schools of thought and all viewpoints to come in to make sure that in, doing this extremely hyper digital revolution, we just don't lose sight of the personal aspect of it. At the end of the day, customer is still a human being. He has still the same values and thoughts and feelings and behaviors that, that he had 25 years ago. He hasn't changed. Okay, uh, so those cannot be left out and it cannot just translate into a bunch of mobile apps and a bunch of technologies and a bunch of uh, you know uh, message formats and uh, uh, server connections etc those can't replace that so that is one of the reasons why we will need people who think in all of these aspects and definitely if you just get the same straight jacketed people who come from the same backgrounds without looking outside of that set of uh, typical skill sets that we traditionally look forward for we will not be able to get that kind of thought process into a digital thing. And the whole digital experience can be very, very painful. And uh, I, 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 being a banker myself for 27 years, I myself know that how hard is it when we just throw banking jargon at people, our own family members. I mean, I can, I, I can speak for my family. If I go and tell my family members about NEFT and RTGS and IMPS, they all blink at me. For me, it's like, how can you not know this? Or how can you not know this NEFT and RTGS? And like, what, are you, what is this? What did you just say? I mean, which language do you just speak? So we need people who can just speak that human language who are not necessarily coming from the same background. So that's really, very really, really critical to have that kind of diversity in the thought process. Thanks, Jagdeep. I think very, very valid point in terms of, you know, diversity is so important, especially in this context that we need to also understand what a person who not from the payments world will think and, you know, customize exactly. the solution or the product accordingly so that adoption exactly. can be given. 
So thank you so much, Jagdish, for your views. We have one question from the audience. Uh, it is not related to leadership, but it is related to what are the new innovations that will drive the uh, business uh, from a payments perspective, payments 4.0. Satish, uh, you being in the product space on the payment side, probably I would invite you to you know, speak on that or what are the new innovations that will drive payments 4.0? All right, thanks, um, here I think uh, uh, we had some really good uh, kind of points being called out uh, in this panel uh, in the last hour or so, and thanks for those. Uh, I think two important aspects which is driving all these transformation is one, uh, you know, the whole aspect of what, how can we give a better customer experience at the end of it uh, in the payment context. And uh, I think some of the practical problems that the panelists talked about are how do you to achieve that, you need to solve the problems from an employee experience internally. And that's where the, uh, you know, the true, true flow of a user journey from a customer standpoint goes end to end. And most often uh, we try and solve the problem at the engagement layer, uh, which is where the customer interacts, but then the employee experience, which is where the remaining part of the journey goes through the middle and back office is where we overlook at it. And uh, so the, if the effort and emphasis or the innovation today is happening largely towards Picking those high velocity user journeys, which has an impact from a user perspective, identifying those from a business standpoint, those could be 20% of the larger, uh, which could impact 80% uh, from a payment business standpoint, picking those 20%, understanding those journeys and solving them end to end from top to bottom, from experience through the operational process and, you know, giving the kind of response from the back office. So the innovation is largely addressing on those elements like, uh, you know, how do you give that feel and experience, give the real time speed and agility that the customer is looking at and uh, more so adopting the right technologies and breaking down those uh, monolithic uh, bigger components of legacy or complicated uh, operational processes, business process, which are running at the back office, simplifying them as services. So, uh, so, and the speed at which you're able to understand the customer context is also leveraging some data. So. Uh, how can I pick up when the customer logs in to do a transaction based on some recent trends that the customer has actually done? Uh, you know, can I can I contextualize the exchange with the customer? So picking those data, be it from social feed, the past transaction feed, the behavior feed, and then applying that on that particular in, uh, particular transaction that the customer is doing is where the customer starts seeing value. And the innovations are all focused towards this, you know, you know, giving a better experience. And they are all uh, top to bottom here. And uh, it's not, there are quite element, quite a few elements on the digital part of it, uh, which would uh, the experience part of it, but a lot of it happens uh, in the, uh, in, with the middle and back office, which are more, you know, sprucing up your uh, uh, applications, making them more microservice and driving those, you know, and uh, that's a huge uh, space uh, that uh, the whole industry is working on. I think we really touched upon some interesting aspects here, which is uh, all focused towards addressing it. And that's, uh, that's the area I look at uh, transforming and heavily being invested today. Great. Uh, thanks. Thanks a lot, Satish, for your views. I think it's been a great discussion uh, in, a, uh, in the last one hour on a topic that is not frequently discussed, especially in such uh, events and uh, seminars. I know it's a little bit out of the box and different for all of us. So thank you so much, uh, all the fellow panelists, uh, for your views. Uh, it's been very, very interesting uh, to uh, understand how leadership is evolving, whether we should have people from the same industry, outside industry, what are the kind of qualities we should look at, what are the metrics that we should uh, be focusing on. And, you know, some of you rightly said that, you know, customer adoption is the key. You know? So uh, with customer adoption, you have, uh, you know, risk, regulatory, security, regulations that all of us need to adhere to. So thank you so much, everyone, for your time. We are at the top of the hour. So uh, we will uh, sign off and we will let the discussion go on. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Thank you. 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 Th